Then he takes off the nose plug and takes a deep breath. Fade out. Oh, hey there, Pick 6 listeners. You caught me wrapping up my new movie. I call it The Stinkin'. And it's all about aliens that are the size of dandelion spores that have an awful odor and invade your body when you breathe them in. There is nothing hotter, according to ChatGPT, than scary movies where one of the five senses can end up killing you. There was listening with A Quiet Place, seeing with this episode's movie, Bird Box, and now The Stinkin'. But while I'm putting the finishing touches on my magnum nopus, let me welcome you to the show. If this is your first time, Pick 6 Movies is a podcast where me, that's Bo Ransdell, and my best pal, Chad Cooper, select six movies based around a theme and call that a season. This is season 23, stream on! Six movies that were considered too good for theaters. They landed on your Hulus and Netflixes and Amazons and invaded our homes whether we liked it or not. And we are welcoming back to the show Sandra Bullock and John Malkovich for this, episode 5 of our 23rd season, for some post-apocalyptic fun with scary winds and whispers and some business about scary demons who make you see old relatives or something. But before that, Chad's going to whip a little knowledge on you, so let's not dally. Slip on the blindfolds and let your ears be filled by a brand new Pick 6 Movies. Take it away, Chad. People have dared other people to do stupid shit ever since the dawn of mankind. Once the internet showed up and YouTube plopped down over there in the corner, dares were elevated to a whole other level. Once people could record others or themselves partaking in particularly and hopefully stupid behavior, these inane friendly challenges became entertainment for all the world to see. And as is often the case, these challenges became an arms race to up the level of physical harm or personal embarrassment that the failure to complete these challenges would produce. Now, one of the most widespread and popular viral internet challenges was the ice bucket challenge, where people would get doused with a bucket of water and ice, and then they would challenge three of their friends to do the same thing, all in an effort to raise awareness of the disease ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing to have a disease named after you. I hope I never find out. <laughs> anyway, the Ice Bucket Challenge was co-founded by Pat Quinn and Pete Freitz. Pat was diagnosed with ALS shortly after his 30th birthday, and he decided to make a video of the original challenge. He called out three of his pals to come in and take the challenge as well. Now, the rub of this particular challenge was that when you nominated three people to dump ice water over their head, they had to do it within 24 hours or make a donation to support ALS. The campaign was massively successful, going on to actually raise $220 million to support ALS research. The challenge was silly and fun and anybody could participate. No harm was usually done and it was for a good cause. It's what Stephen Covey would call a real win-win scenario. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in the win-lose scenarios where we, the YouTube viewing audience, win as we watch you, the viral internet challenge participant, lose. Let's take a look. What do we have here when it comes to viral internet challenges? Oh. Here's a good one, the fire challenge. This involved people rubbing flammable substances on their body and then setting themselves afire and then posting a video of that on the internet. Hmm, that's a little too protesty for my taste. Well, what else do we have in here? Ooh, this sounds good. The salt and ice challenge. This involved adding salt to your body and then rubbing ice all over it to see how long you could tolerate the chemical reaction between the two and the accompanying painful heat that it produces. Hmm, not exactly what I'm looking for either. Let's keep going. Oh, this sounds good. The Tide Pod Challenge. This involved putting a Tide Pod in your mouth. That led to medical officials warning the public, well, the stupid ones, not to put harmful chemicals in your mouth. Do we have anything that doesn't lead to hospitalization? Oh, here's one, the mannequin challenge. That sounds fun, how's that work? Uh, This one involved people or groups just standing very still while they were filmed, oftentimes while the song Black Beatles played in the background. Some of these got pretty elaborate, 
with one school pulling this off with over 1,500 students participating in a video running over six minutes long, where they all stood still in the school as the camera toured the hallways of this educational establishment. Kids will do anything to get out of going to class. Moving on, the Kylie Jenner lip challenge. What's this one all about? Let's see, it says here, people would imitate Kylie Jenner's signature full lips by inserting one of their own lips into a small glass and then drawing out the air with their mouth. After removing the glass, the participant would have a fuller set of lips. But at times, this could make the participant's mouth look like a prolapsed anus, good God, and leave to permanent <laughs> lip disfiguration, hard pass. What's this? The cinnamon challenge. People would put a spoonful of cinnamon in their mouth and swallow it. Huh. Says here that most people would end up coughing uncontrollably, leading to difficulties breathing, and in some extreme cases, a collapsed lung. Good for you. Speaking of sticking things in your mouth, how about the Sprite Banana Challenge, which included eating two bananas and drinking a Sprite without vomiting? There you go, youth of America. Hey, speaking of vomiting, how about the Gallon Challenge? This involves someone drinking a gallon of milk in one big gulp. Wait a minute, Pop's over on Regular Show. He did that during Guys Night. I love Regular Show. Hey, look, if you don't want to uh, drink a whole gallon of milk, you could show off some real assholery with the gallon smashing challenge. This was where participants just went into a store, grabbed a gallon of milk, and as the name implies, they smashed it on the ground in the store while a fellow degenerate filmed them. What a couple of assholes. How about the duct tape challenge, which involved wrapping someone in duct tape and sticking them to the wall to see how long it took for them to escape. This gained some notoriety when a guy who'd been duct taped up, he, uh, he suffered an aneurysm and fell over and cracked his head open. He almost died, but he didn't. Let's keep going here. Do we have any challenges that uh, really help people remove themselves from the gene pool? Oh, this sounds like a good one. The coronavirus challenge, which became popular during the early days of the pandemic. Here, people would just walk around and lick publicly available objects, like hand poles on the subway train, and in one instance, an airplane toilet seat. That last example was completed by an aspiring TikTok influencer who posted the video in March of 2020, noting that the coronavirus was just for poor people. Oh, what a terrible human being she is. Now, all of these internet challenges have one thing in common, varying degrees of stupidity. But there was one internet challenge that wasn't the brainchild of some YouTubing ding dong. It was actually inspired by a feature film. The Bird Box Challenge was directly tied to the movie that is the subject of this very episode. The Bird Box Challenge in and of itself wasn't that dangerous of a challenge as it was inspired by Sandra Bullock's character in the film as she performs multiple activities throughout the narrative of that movie while blindfolded. The marketing team behind Bird Box and Netflix, where the movie was available, well, they hooked up with some Twitch streamers in Australia where these gamers would play their video games while blindfolded. That sounds like delightfully fun, innocent entertainment. But the internet did that thing that the internet does, where they come in and kind of screw everything up for everybody. People started replicating the challenge in all manner of activities, including but not limited to walking around the hallways of their home, walking through parking lots, trying to go down a flight of stairs, mostly harmless, as YouTube has a guideline that says you can't promote harmful activities on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> since when? Social media personality turned professional boxer Jake Paul, he took the Bird Box Challenge to a whole nother level by agreeing to do it for a full 24 hours straight. During this time, he walked through traffic. He also got punched in the face by one of his buddies. Speaking of traffic-related bird box challenges, there was a 17-year-old girl in Utah who partook of the challenge while she was driving her car. Guess what happened? That's right, she crashed her car. Luckily, nobody died. Netflix actually sent out a formal response that read, can't believe I have to say this, but please do not hurt yourself with the bird box challenge. We don't know how this got started. <laughs> yeah, Netflix, I think you know how it got started. Netflix did go on to say in their official message that they appreciated all of the free publicity. <laughs> I mean, love that the movie was getting, but they didn't want to see people end up in the hospital 
due to all of these Bird Box Challenge memes. And all this free publicity, <laughs> I mean love, helped this director streaming film become one of the most successful and popular movies distributed on Netflix. Well, according to Netflix. In 2014, author Josh Mallerman published his post-apocalyptic novel, Bird Box. The book focused on a woman who guides her two children to safety under the threat of this unforeseen force that's stirring up a bit of trouble for the people of Earth. But more on that later. The book was written utilizing flashbacks and is told out of order, going from present day post apocalyptic timeframes and then flashing back to pre apocalyptic timeframes. The book comes out and it was, you know, genuinely well received, with some critics drawing comparisons to the fiction of Stephen King. There were also notable similarities to the film's plot and that of M. Night Shyamalan's 2008 film, The Happening, which we featured on season 11, episode two of this very podcast. Mallerman claimed that he actually produced a rough draft of the novel Bird Box prior to the release of the film, The Happening. But the similarities between the two are, <laughs> come on, uh, you know, invisible mystery force causes people to kill themselves. <laughs> Whatever you say, Mallerman. The movie rights to the novel Bird Box were scooped up by Universal Studios prior to the book's release. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Originally, Andres Muschietti, who directed those two reboot movies of It, he was going to come in and direct this movie, but that was back in 2013. And then Netflix swooped in and they bought the rights to the novel and they wanted to develop the film to star America's sweetheart Sandra Bullock and cinematic oddity John Malkovich. Taking over the director's chair duties would be Danish filmmaker Suzanne Beer. Originally, she said no to directing the film, but then a little bit later, she said, all right, I'll do it. To adapt the screenplay was none other than Eric Heiserer. How do I know that name? Oh, that's right. He was the guy who wrote that reboot of Nightmare on Elm Street. Whoa, buckle up, people. Beer, the film's director, she ended up having to address more similarities that arose between Bird Box and another film's plot, A Quiet Place, where people have to tippy-toe around lest they get killed by a monster. Whereas in Bird Box, you got to move around with your eyes all closed lest you get killed by a monster. Beer pointed out that Bird Box was filmed in April of 2018, and the first time she'd even heard about A Quiet Place was when they were wrapping up editing. You know, that had to be a real gut punch. The movie's about what? They can't talk or a monster gets them. Eh, our movie's about people who can't see or a monster gets them. That's where the similarities end. They're totally different, except for the fact that they're completely the same. When it came to similarities and differences between the novel and the adaptation of the movie, there were some changes. For example, the ending of the movie is way more optimistic than what happened in the book. <laughs> Note to self, do not read Bird Box, the novel. John Malkovich's character, he's not even in the book at all. Look at you, screenwriter, Eric Heiserer, making shit up that doesn't need to be in the movie, just like in that Nightmare on Elm Street reboot, you rascal. Filmmakers considered showing the monster that's causing all the trouble in this movie, but they opted to let that remain a mystery, which was a pretty good call. They did go so far as to actually film the monsters creeping around inside one of the houses, but uh, the creatures that were created by the special effects team, when they brought them in uh, and they showed them to the crew, everybody kind of laughed. So I think they just probably threw those in a dumpster and went on their merry way. Reportedly, Sandra Bullock spent some time with a blind man who specialized in helping other blind people navigate their real world environment so that the actress could understand how sounds behave differently in different spaces. And it also allowed her to better understand how people can move around without the use of their sight. Bullock's commitment to her training was so intense that it led to her Mr. Magooing her way into a camera on set, drawing blood from her skull. Take that, Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> Nine Inch Nails own Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross were brought in to score the movie. They produced a notable amount of music for the film, but when the movie came out, Reznor and Ross were not happy with the mix of the music in the movie, referring to their involvement with the film's production as a quote, fucking waste of time, end quote. Language, fellas. When the movie was finally released, Netflix heralded the film as a resounding success, stating that the movie was viewed by 45 million accounts worldwide, 
giving it the best first seven days ever for an original Netflix film. Is that a lot? Who knows? They're scoring their own performance. Did all these people watch the whole movie? I don't know. Maybe they watched two minutes. Maybe. Are these all unique accounts? Or does that include just the owner of the account or her no good ex-boyfriend or her nephew who's in college and that friend of hers who's dealing with some hard times? Doesn't matter. The movie had buzz. The film did receive mixed reviews, but they weren't dramatically positive or dramatically negative. It was mostly a, eh, when it came to people's reaction to Bird Box. But as for viewership, Bird Box was undeniably one of the most popular Netflix original movies ever released. I mean, if it's so popular, there's got to be a sequel in the works, right? Well, of course there is. Mallerman, the book's author, he rode the wave of success that the film adaptation of his novel brought, and he cranked out a follow-up book titled Mallory, which is the name of Sandra Bullock's character in the film. There are rumors of it being adapted into a film or possibly a spin-off version set in the same universe, focusing on different geographic regions, utilizing a diversity of languages. Hmm, that sounds interesting. But I guess for the time being, we're just going to have to be happy with the bird box in our hands that stars America's sweetheart Sandra Bullock and my favorite big screen weirdo John Malkovich. You know what? Let's not waste any more time and get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here, strap on some blindfolds, and see if we can make our way from the start of this movie to the end of this movie without killing ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, boy and girl, Pick 6 Movies presents to you the third most popular film ever released on Netflix, maybe according to Netflix, probably. <laughs> it's 2018's Tweet Tweet Bird Box. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by the man who is the wind beneath my wings, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? I can't see <laughs> how we're going to make this movie any fun. That's professional podcasting. In our last episode, you told me to go watch A Quiet Place in preparation for this review. Good news, I didn't do that. Uh, bad okay. news, I did watch Bird Box twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a quiet place once is equal to two bird boxes. Uh, that is the algebra of of cinema. A quiet place in our hand is worth two bird boxes in the bush. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I got a, a little bit of feedback on the last episode. Uh oh. <laughs> right. You never want that. <laughs> as as often as we encourage people to reach out, we don't really want that. No, no, no. Of course we do. Um, but <laughs> somebody referred to it as the. God, I hate this movie episode for Army of the Dead. You got my email. <laughs> right. That is, <laughs> that is not inaccurate. Army of the Dead really tested us as individuals. Army of the Dead is a truly, truly terrible movie. It's one of the worst I think we've ever done on this show. So far. Yeah. <laughs> like We say that a lot. It's a bar that keeps lowering. <laughs> but it is up there. It, like If we were to put together a top ten list of the worst things we've ever watched for for pick six movies i would put army of the dead on that list bird box while not a good movie by any stretch is not of that caliber so rest assured this is not going to be another i hate this movie so much episode where we might actually have a good time had you seen bird box prior yeah see i'd never watch it i'd heard of it but didn't mm -hmm. take time to watch it during the pandemic i was busy watching fox news licking toilet seats blaming the pool i think bird, bird box was pre-vaccine so it was like hey we're all stuck together in silence and so what better way to celebrate that than with a movie all about some unseen thing that is killing all of us i can relate to this <laughs> <laughs> right like i'm one of those people that watched the movie contagion within the first month of the pandemic, like of the shutdown, you know, when everybody went home, you remember this shed. Um, it's one of the defining moments of our generation. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I was one of those people that was like, huh, let's look, peek into the future. How bad could this be? 
And it turns out Contagion, uh, while the virulence of the disease perhaps uh, did not match that of the one in Contagion, the general reaction of government and press and that kind of thing was incredibly accurate, which was depressing. We did that whole season when the pandemic broke out called we're all gonna die Mm -hmm. dealt with a lot of those topics sort of yeah i was really disappointed that they weren't able to make a vaccine as quickly as dustin hoffman did an outbreak just by squeezing a little monkey juice (laughs) onto renee russo and then everything was good to go actually i think that that's how (laughs) the pandemic started (laughs) right just putting a monkey in a blender and shooting that into somebody yeah i've tried that a number of times uh in the hopes of becoming a superhero that also does not work I've tried spiders, monkeys. I tried one pig. That sounds like you're trying to summon a demon. You know, what? however this works out, Chad. <laughs> if, if at the end of the day I have superpowers and an extended lifespan. Or a sidekick from the netherworld. Oh, that would be good, too. <laughs> I have a demon? Um... <laughs> This is our third movie featuring Sandra Bullock, because we did While You Were Sleeping, and then Uh we also reviewed Speed 2, which means she's getting close to Burt Reynolds' territory for repeat appearances on this podcast. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right in the high country at that point. But it goes to show, I think, that Sandra Bullock is generally the best thing about bad movies. Like, I don't don't like Bird Box as a film, but I like her yeah and like i don't i don't necessarily like her character as much but there are moments where i am struck by the fact that like sandra bullock is a good actress and she's putting in a real performance here however that shakes out in terms of the quality of the movie is is separate from the fact that she really went for it yeah Again, it's not a bad movie. It's just not a very good movie. Yeah. It it makes it difficult to recommend or not recommend. As I look for movies to discuss on this season, what I found was this sea of mediocrity for films that go straight to streaming services. And most of them, like at best, were, eh. Uh, you know, uh, something, you know, they weren't movies that I think if they had been released in theaters would have pulled in large audiences. I agree. I think Bird Box might have done reasonably well. I don't think it would have done Quiet Place numbers, but it could have done something. Not necessarily because of the quality of the movie, but just sort of premise. And, you know, horror movies are somewhat bulletproof. Like some of them tank, but most of them at least make their budget back. I don't think the title of this movie did itself any favors. Like I would have leaned more into the the blind part of the film as opposed to the bird part you know at a quiet place you get it like it's a quiet place you gotta be quiet like in this movie steal a little mojo from the it movies and call the movie don't look at it you're like what it is it the clown like well you gotta go see you know or like uh yeah how about sight for sore eyes sight for sore eyes would be pretty good how about blind trust would that be good well like blind period trust period blind side two just trick them. <laughs> right. Like Sandra Bullock is back in Blindside 2. Oh, wait. This is a dumb, dumb horror movie about people who have to wear bandanas over their face. <laughs> this will speak to how much I genuinely like Sandra Bullock. I have seen The Blindside at least three times. I watched about 14 minutes when I was at the eye doctor once. They were showing it for some weird reason. <laughs> yeah. Why would you show The Blindside at an eye doctor now that I think about it? <laughs> <laughs> right you do that you do the the movie blindness you do bird box mr cooper i'm sorry your macular degeneration is progressing no right mr magoo starring leslie nielsen <laughs> you know all the all the hits all the eye hits <laughs> well you know what? let's get into this movie things kick off and i think we're in northern california somewhere it looks like in the pacific northwest and we get an aerial drone shot of a river surrounded by evergreen trees and we hear a voiceover from a radio that says we have a compound we have a community it's safe here how many of you are there are there any children and i was like look all of these comments should sound alarms collectively (laughs) you should avoid whoever is talking to you on the other end of this radio at all costs I think it says something that the apocalypse is the pervert's real dream scenario, (laughs) because you can ask a lot of really 
forward and probing questions <laughs> and be like, hey, I'm just making sure it's safe for you to bring us to this community that we have here. So I have to ask you, like, what are you into? Do you like wear, to wear short skirts? The voice goes on to say, uh, the fastest way to get here is by the river. Um, I don't think you could make it with any kids unless they're between the ages of 13 and 15. <laughs> like, what? This may be a first in Pick 6 movies history. We get the title of the movie and zero opening credits. I mean, uh -huh. other than the, the Netflix Presents, you get Bird Box, we are done. And I was like, I love this movie. Yeah, and also the fact that this movie uh, has like eight to ten minutes of credits on the back end. Which is where they belong. Yeah. If you want to stick around and watch them, you can do that. Don't make me watch your credits at the beginning, because nobody cares. So we cut to Sandra Bullock prior to The River, and it's her having a heart-to-heart -heart with her children, who are named boy and girl in the movie, as we will learn. Mm -hmm. And she's like, listen, you kids, I'm going to tell you this one time. You both of you need to shut the fuck up and listen, or you're both going to die. You have to do every single thing I say, or we're not going to make it. You understand? Under no circumstances are you allowed to take off your blindfold. If you do, I will hurt you. The place we are leaving here, this is just a place. You each get a stuffed animal to take. And if you don't do what I say, you're going to fucking die, you two. Yeah, this is not the Sandra Bullock from our other two movies. She's a hard ass in this. Where's that Sandy Bullock who danced around on that cut-rate cruise ship or pretended to be the fiancé of a comatose man leading to romantic comedic hijinks, Bo? Ironically, this is how my stepmother would send us off to school every day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we see Sandra Bullock like, grab a box of birds and you're like, hey, bird box, I get it. That's the title of this movie that I just saw. And puts these birds from a cage and puts them in a box and off they go. Let me ask you this. If someone asked you why this movie is called bird box you say because birds can detect when this monster or whatever is around right well yeah and then you say well and thematically it's about someone who is reserved and trapped in themselves and trapped by their responsibility finally reaching a place where they can be free oh c minus on that theme at best bo you're really making a stretch that's an a paper my friend <laughs> apparently you are not attending the same liberal arts colleges i have hey what I could... whoa what if they called the movie boat trip other than the fact that that was the name of the cuba gooding jr horatio sands screwball movie where they... let's pretend to be gay yeah they were gay <laughs> on a cruise ship <laughs> yeah uh, although better movie <laughs> if Bird Box involves the kids having to pretend to be gay to get a ride to safety. <laughs> and Sandra Bullock having to coach him through that. Like, no, look, it doesn't matter if you're a homosexual. You don't act any different. Mm -hmm. All right? All this swishing around you're doing, you're bringing attention to yourself. Nobody's buying it. Now, boy, you need to like musical theater more. So we cut to Sandra Bullock and boy and girl, and they're wearing blindfolds. And they're walking out of this house through the woods, following a string that leads down to the river's edge. Bo, this movie is full of plot holes, mm -hmm. at the very least. I mean, and it's got numerous questions that need to be answered. And for me, it all starts here. Who put up this string to guide them down there? How did they even find their way to do this? How did they discover that there was a boat by the river? These are just my first three questions. I, I've got like reams of paper with questions about how did this happen? And it never addresses any of it. That is my confusion as well, because I didn't think this was their original house. Like this is a house they ended up at, right? Yeah, they go from house to house to house. Yeah. You're blind. Think about just doing that where you live now. It would be impossible, literally impossible, to do what they do. Right. It's really frustrating. Oh, like Part of me is like, I don't want this movie to spend time telling me about the ins and outs of how they are living because it's already long enough. But yeah, it's distracting. Like you said, especially the boat of like, how did you both find a boat and then disguise it? In an effective way without like peeking every now and again right. to be like, all right, I might go crazy and kill myself, but I need to know if I put the branches in the right place. Make it to where they don't have to be blind all the time, only when they hear the sounds of the creature nearby or they feel yeah. there's a threat. Like, okay, I get it. Then you have to maneuver when danger is around. So that's what happens here because you get this ominous rush of wind that we learn sort of suggests the presence of these creatures, these aliens or whatever. Not aliens. They're really kind of demonic, maybe. 
They don't explain it. I think they're just happenings. <laughs> right. Individual happenings running around. Yeah, they find this boat that they've disguised with leaves and stuff, and they push it into the water, and off Central Bullet goes with her kids. Paddling away blindfolded. Bo, you ever rode a boat? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Dude, it's hard. And, like, just yeah. doing it blindfolded, you would be stuck on the riverbank in less than five minutes. This is one of those scenarios, like, this whole blind box situation in the post-apocalypse, where I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to look at the thing. Yeah, just end it. Right. The, I don't want to spend the rest of my life trying to bust into people's houses, maybe getting killed by people in the same position I am, or the crazies running around that we'll talk to talk about in a bit. Right. It's over. As Lil Ray says later in the movie, we have been judged and been found wanting. The verdict is in. <laughs> Let's not waste time. Let me rip off this blindfold and go sit in the burning car and be done with it. The movie then cuts to five years earlier. According to the text overlay, very nice. Mm. We see Sandra Bullock and she now has shorter hair and she's painting while listening to the song Coming Down by the Dum Dum Girls. Sandra Bullock also appears to be pregnant and she mm -hmm. is a professional painter, Bo. An artistic painter, not a house painter. God forbid she'd be a house painter and have a job that allows her to make money for a living. Her sister is played by sarah paulson she's in all those american horror story seasons i do believe mm -hmm. never watch that but that's the thing that i kind of sort of know her from yeah she had a very bit part in the movie serenity based on the show firefly that was the first time i saw her and now every time i see even though she's gone on to do a number of great things every time i see her i'm like oh yeah from serenity she comes in and she turns off the music and sandra bullock says hey asshole i was listening to that and sarah paulson says yeah so is everybody else down the street. Also, turn on the news. Something big is happening. So Sandra Bullock goes over and she turns on the news. And the reporter says, People are fleeing cities in Europe by train and on foot. And there are reports of mass suicides first started in Romania. The estimated death toll is in the tens of thousands. Luckily, this isn't happening here in the good old US of A. Mom and apple pie have nothing to worry about. But local officials are requesting that the public remain calm. This news anchor is heading home, loading all eight of his guns, heading straight to his Jim Baker brand end of days bunker, and tuning into Alex Jones to hear what's really going on. Back to you, Janet! Clunk. <laughs> 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 And Sarah Paulson is telling Central Bullock, I talked to our mom and about your pregnancy and all the things going on in your life. Central Bullock is like, I don't know why you guys have to talk about me. Yeah, I'm about to have this baby and I'm a painter and there's a lot of interesting things about my life right now, but I, I would advise you to keep it to yourself. Mm, that's not going to happen. How about I drive you to your obstetrician's appointment and then I'll have something to talk to mom about. <laughs> you know, that baby girl in your tummy. What makes you think it's going to be a girl? Wishful thinking. I don't even want to think about that. I haven't even thought about baby names really much. I mean, gosh, if I have a son, maybe I can name him boy. I mean, hell, picking out baby names is a cinch. If I get a dog, I'm just going to call it dog. If I get a cat, I'm going to call it cat. I like that when she names these kids, she has the same level of imagination that Pee Wee Herman had when naming his sentient furniture. It's like, Cherry, <laughs> Flory, Globy. <laughs> I like that Sarah Paulson here is checking out Sandra Bullock's painting, and she's like, oh my god, this is depressing. Look at how everyone <laughs> looks so sad and lonely. Sandra Bullock is like, no, that's just a side effect of their inability to connect. Is that a theme for this movie? Whatever. Hey, can we just go to the gynecologist already? I'm starting to get bored with this scene. And also, there's kind of an indication that Sandra Bullock is not exactly an agoraphobe, but that she doesn't leave her house much. And it doesn't really resurface surface later in the movie it's just not a thing but there is this sense like she is kind of a misanthrope that she avoids people at almost all costs but again doesn't really show back up in the movie thanks to the screenplay by tim her yeah um from nightmare on elm street remake fame oh god they go to this baby doctor and it's this woman, and she says, You don't want to know the sex of your baby? By the way, here's a pamphlet called So You Don't Want to Be a Mother. Try Adoption. <laughs> and she hands her a, a little pamphlet that pretty much says, Adoption, the pros and cons, but mostly the pros. You know, Sandra Bullock kind of gives it an eye and is like, Let me just put this in my back pocket. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to give the baby up, but on the other hand, I don't really feel any connection to this child, so maybe. It cuts to Sandra Bullock vomiting in the toilet toilet and her sister's outside cracking jokes about how she can't wait to tell their mom about sandra bullock vomiting and how hilarious that is and as they leave the doctor's office
this. On their way out, they see a woman that they saw when they entered. And we know it's the same woman because she's wearing this bright orange tracksuit. And this lady is now just smashing her head against a window. Mm-hmm. It is a mess. And then Sandra Bullock, she rushes outside and she gets in the car with her sister and she says, whatever that thing was in Russia, it's made its way here. And now everybody's killing themselves. We got to go. This is one of the big centerpiece moments of the movie right like this is the hey society is totally falling apart now yeah and they don't really waste much time getting this thing into second or third gear but then they immediately downshift and we kind of drag along for another couple of hours once sandra bullock is in the car we see an ambulance come around and just crash outside the hospital Uh uh-oh and then people are just screaming and running through the streets this one car stops in the middle of the road a cop car speeds around and then in the background there's this huge explosion from automobiles it's pretty fantastic as all of this starts going bananas around them sarah paulson is like all right, we'll just go to my place. I live out in the country. We can hang out with the horses. You won't want to be in, in a car on the roads when this all <laughs> like shakes loose. So, you know, we're going to be set up. We'll call mom. Everything's going to be cool. At one point, Sandra Bullock is like, you need to go faster. And she, Sarah Paul says like, I'm not going to run through a red light. <laughs> it's like, hey, it's the apocalypse. You can put on the put your foot on the gas here. About this time, Sarah Paulson, her eyes dilate broadly and she's just like it's so beautiful i'm just i'm frightened but i can't uh, and then she just drives her suv into this other car flipping the suv that contains our two movie stars it does a full 180 and just lands on the roof yeah sarah paulson climbs out of the car as does sandra bullock and then sarah paulson she just steps in front of a garbage truck and gets a full samaritan treatment splat goes sarah paulson she is out of our movie. She is just a stain now, yeah. And the reason Sandra Bullock didn't see whatever Sarah Paulson saw is because she was looking in the back of the car for Sarah Paulson's cell phone and didn't know what was up until Sarah Paulson's flipping over the car. And there's chaos everywhere. We see a baby stroller rolling down the road by itself, <laughs> which is maybe my favorite like single shot in the movie. It's sort of that old story of, you know, the shortest story ever told is free baby shoes never worn. This is one of those like oh there is a backstory to this stroller and i'm kind of curious to hear it so off to the side of sandra bullock is this large home that looks like emmett brown's house circa 1955 uh-huh outside the house is john malkovich who screams at his wife you wife get back in the house malkovich's wife says i've got to help sandra bullock she's pregnant and the star of our movie and then his wife makes it to the street helps up sandra bullock and then the the wife turns around and says mom is that you oh please don't go and then john malkovich's wife walks over and gets into a car that is fully engulfed in flames and just barbecues herself to death yeah it's pretty good maybe she was she heard about that fire challenge she's like i'm gonna win this thing (laughs) and win in quotes (laughs) somebody filmed this then a guy we will learn his name is tom he comes out of the house to help her inside he's played by trayvon rhodes he was in moonlight i don't really know him from yeah. anything else I, again i think that most of the performances in this movie are pretty good i think he's good in this he's the most awesome guy ever <laughs> he does say some weird things again this is a script not attributed to the actor we'll get to his belly rubbing fetish in a little bit but the only thing that was missing from his character was that he was a firefighter and saved orphans everything about him is so cliche to be hunky and dreamy and romantic he's the kind of guy that in a job interview is going to tell you that his biggest drawback is that he cares too much Uh and perhaps works too hard tom is everything on a checklist of everything that a heterosexual woman would want in a man that's tom yes and (laughs) he runs out and pulls her inside and in the house we've got a bunch of people in there there's john malkovich as you pointed out uh uh, bd wong yes he stirred up all that trouble yeah jurassic world boy did he ever malkovich immediately (laughs) is like i don't think we should let them in and bd wong says look this is my house and they are coming in and malkovich says look my wife lydia went to help them and now she is dead but (laughs) inside we have even more survivors there's blonde guy played by machine gun kelly uh there's hispanic lady is she the cop yes okay then there's little Lil ray howard the grocery store guy yeah 
Then there's old lady. There's blonde lady. And blonde husband. But they're not in the movie long enough to really matter. I don't know why they're introduced in the movie. I guess just to be the first of the cannon fodder. Because that's what a lot of these characters are. Like Sandra Bullock, once she gets inside, she tries to call her mom and doesn't get an answer. Malkovich, meanwhile, is like this is terrorism you can tell cedra bullock sees a horse on tv which reminds her of her sister and how depressing all of this is the old woman in the house is like i felt something something's going on out there machine gun kelly really puts a fine point on it when he says we are so fucking fucked (laughs) like thanks machine gun yeah i don't think that was the script i think that was all improvised uh (laughs) because i'm not sure machine gun kelly can memorize things we do see a world map on the news that shows that this is happening all over europe and northern africa the west coast of north and south america and in eastern asia so it's basically everywhere tom our hunky male lead he chimes in and he says you know my crew we saw one one minute we were just digging the foundation for an orphanage and the next minute my (laughs) contractor just lied down in front of a bulldozer i came over to give him a foot rub because he looked like he was you know a little tense but uh he ended up getting run over by the bulldozer it was a it was a real mess i sent flowers to his wife and children yeah i didn't get an answer at the flower shop but i guess it's the thought that counts and just so you know i tried to save jimmy carter who was also there helping us build those houses uh, for all those orphans but it was just too late bd wong chimes in and says hey guys i'm reading the script it says here that if you look at it it makes you crazy or want to hurt yourself and i think that pretty much summarizes the core of our movie's antagonist so carry on malkovich corrects it was like no bd wong if you see it you want to kill yourself it's an important distinction weren't you a scientist at jurassic park I truly expect more from you, sir. As we all know, Jurassic Park is frightening in the dark. All the dinosaurs were running wild. Tom says, hey, 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 maybe we should just say, let's let's drop the temperature a little bit. What if we just close the windows and blinds so we won't have to look at it and then we won't kill ourselves? I'm full of good ideas. The blonde lady and her husband get a call from their son, Bailey. Yeah. Who is clearly dying on the other end of the line. It's just like, yeah. Mom, Dad, I'm seeing something that makes me want to kill myself. And they're like, we've got to go. See you later. Thump, 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 thump. And I understand why, of course. But all the other people in the house are like, you should not go outside. Like, that is a really bad decision. They're like, we're going to be fine. Meanwhile, they're not fine. Oh, there they go. They're outside. Oh, they're in that burning car. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. That burning car is a real magnet for these people. There. <laughs> if you get past the burning car, maybe... You... Nope, nope. Turns out there's a news factory right next door. That is <laughs> unfortunate. What's next door to that? A rickety stool store? Oh, for all the luck. Then the gun store? Oh, uh, this is a bad neighborhood. <laughs> Then check cashing. Well, that's just going to kill you financially. And what's right next to it? A franchised version of the improv? You go in there, you're going to die laughing. Stay out of there, people! (laughs) Um, Then the TV says that the president has declared a state of emergency, and then everything just goes dark. Like, Mm -hmm. you get the bars on the TV. And then grocery store guy says, man, it's in game. Humanity has been judged. We've been found wanting. You probably want to know who did the judging they go by many names from world religions and mythology it's it's full of demons it's an an entity that that takes your worst fears and deepest sadness and greatest losses and and it manipulates you and machine gun kelly chimes in yeah that sounds like bullshit and i was like you know what i would 100 percent be team machine gun kelly at least on this count yes oh yeah right here grocery store guy goes on to say it's not bullshit it's facts and then this dude just turns into dan Aykroyd. And he's just like, spiritual beings have uh, different names from various cultures, such as Akamana, uh, Sagat, Hujijing, and Puka. And nobody think of anything. Clear your minds. Oh, great. Stay puffed, Marshmallow Man. You know, the Puka was the thing that Jimmy Stewart saw in the movie Harvey. I never realized that it was a demonic entity until now. Oh, I thought that immediately. Harvey, well, you make me want to kill myself. Grocery store guy goes on to say, these demon spirits, they make pregnant women view their babies as lobsters or spiders. And, but this was where I was like, this movie is utter nonsense. This is just silly. Yeah. Tom checks on Sandra Bullock to see if she's okay after her fall outside. Not to mention the fact that she was in a car accident that ended with the vehicle flipping and landing on its roof. 
How how she didn't lose the baby right there is beyond me. Sandra Bullock recounts seeing her sister kill herself and she starts to show some emotion. And then Sandra Bullock says, I saw that woman come out to help me. She started talking to her mom like up in the sky. Then she got in that burning car and then she burned herself up. And then Malkovich, this is where he just lays into Sandra Bullock. That sounds like bullshit. First of all, her name was Lydia. Get it right. Also, her mother's been dead for 10 years, you stupid cow. It is <laughs> like he gets raw with her. <laughs> it's so good. Like Malkovich is such a bright spot in this movie. I I love him so much. He brings, you know, that kind of weirdness that like a Crispin Glover almost yeah. does to a movie of like or a christopher walk and just that kind of actor that is just them in most performances like he's really good and he's a good actor and and you believe him in the part but it's also just quality malkovich sometimes where it's yeah. just like man john malkovich tore into me the way he tears into sandra bullock i would never stop being ashamed <laughs> Even if he was wrong, and he's kind of wrong in this situation, but it doesn't matter because he's just so convincing. Sandra Bullock, she lays awake at night thinking about all the things that John Malkovich said to her to make her feel less than. And there's a shadow that passes over the window. And you're like, oh, what was that, Bo? So then we cut back to the start of our movie where Sandra Bullock is in this boat with these two blindfolded kids. And the title overlay says six hours on the river, which I call bullshit on this because being with two kids in a confined space for six hours, way too long. In a rowboat on a river, two kids, one of these individuals is ending up in the water, either voluntarily or just by getting tossed overboard. Yeah, the real year is if you cut to six hours later and there's just two people in that boat. Right. Just kind of looking at each other like, so we're never going to mention what happened? No, 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 not at all. Okay. You saw what happened to girl, right? Oh, yes. Who? <laughs> exactly. Ah, a lot more room here now. That's right. And a lot quieter. That's what I was going for. <laughs> you two just wouldn't shut the fuck up. She's looking real ragged. They have this blanket pulled over them. She's trying to get a response from the guy that sent them the original radio message whose name is rick so she picks up the phone she's like rick 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 <laughs> i got my ears pierced i got my nose pierced <laughs> <laughs> no one answers and the birds start chirping and she hears whatever demonic entity these are whisper mallory which is her name in the movie then we go back to the past where we're back in the house with Malkovich and B.D. Wong. They're listening to the radio and some dude sounds real amateur, right? Like he's just like, hey, here's the skinny. Don't go outside. Don't look at anything because that's what makes you go crazy. Yeah. And Malkovich is like, huh? Well, it looks like our food is running out because some fatty fat fats here in the house are eating it all. <laughs> And he looks over at Sandra Bullock, who's just like snacking on some Nilla wafers or something. What's your boy looking at me? You're eating for seven. And it turns <laughs> out that, that before the apocalypse happened, he was suing B.D. Wong. Like this comes out in the conversation. Yeah. And we don't learn the why just yet, but that is kind of floating out there now. And then a knock comes at the door. This yeah. woman at the front door like, hey, let me in, please. Candy Graham. Uh, yeah, you're that clever shark, aren't you? I'm just a dolphin. Half of our jokes are just references to Saturday Night Live sketches pre-2000. Yeah, right, from 50 years ago. <laughs> They're arguing over whether to let her in or not. Surprise, surprise, Malkovich is like, do not let that person in. I will shoot her, then I will shoot you. Whoever lets her in is gonna get a tongue lashing like you would not believe. Tom walks over to the door and says, hey, hey, let me undo the top two buttons of my shirt here it sounds like this young lady's telling the truth plus if she's got candy with a candy gram I, I like candy who doesn't like candy let's open up and see what's going on john malkovich here was just talking about how we needed some extra food while she shows up with bonbons that's a win-win for everybody sandra bullock from somewhere she grabs a gun she aims it at the door and then tom lets this person in and when she comes in he hands her a blanket to cover i guess the light outside and then everybody inside they put their hands over their eyes like they're all in a game of hide and seek and they're collectively it this is meant to be 
intense, but I just found it to be confusing. They do this a lot in this movie when they let people in and out of the building that everybody's like, close your eyes or I don't understand. So these demon monsters, whatever, they can't come indoors. Maybe they're like vampires. You have to invite them inside. That's something else about the rules of this movie. And I can't believe I'm going to say it's the happening did this better. Remember, they were covering up vents and trying to keep the stinky air from outside making them all go crazy. Uh huh. I think that you could probably lean one way or the other, meaning that you either explain this in more detail or maybe just make it even more abstract. It's kind of misbegotten. I just don't know how you account for this without at least paying it some kind of lip service. And the movie does the exact wrong thing, which is to ignore the question entirely. The woman who comes in, her name is Olympia. Mm -hmm. So she walks into the house and grocery store guy looks at this woman and he says, so are you pregnant? What? There's a real flip of a coin as to whether or not Olympia was on her way to the OB or the Arby's. Because she <laughs> she might be pregnant or she just might be a fat woman. <laughs> Who's to say? Yeah. But it turns out she is pregnant and she asks Sandra Bullock about her fat belly. And it turns out that they're due real close to one another, which will come into play uh, later in the almost film. Almost the same day. Same time, though. It's weird. <laughs> Malkovich has another great line here where he says, great, now we can all starve in the maternity ward. Two fat cows grazing the pantry. And then B.D. Wong is like, hey, I've got an idea. Maybe we can kind of see without seeing. And Malkovich is like, that makes no sense. Wait, wait, wait. Hear me out. What if we introduce a plot point into the film that'll just waste time and won't really matter at all? Well, I'm game. What if we were to try to, to view the monster on my video surveillance system? And so they go upstairs and B.D. Wong volunteers to get tied to a chair as he watches the creatures on a computer screen from his video cameras. This just leads to him seeing the monster and then flopping himself over, smacking his head on the ground, and then he dies. During this scene as he's tied to this chair, we get a couple of character moments. Malkovich talking to Sandra Bullock about why he was suing B.D. Wong. And he says, they were going to tear down this part of the house and build a giant glass monstrosity. And Sandra Bullock was like, so what? <laughs> you know, why do you care, Mr. Malkovich? I mean, this is all their home to do with as they please. And he said, because then I would have to look at it. Which kind of tells you all you need to know about that character. Uh, the Hispanic lady cop tells Machine Gun Kelly that there's no way they're going to fuck. All of this is unnecessary, Bo. And as much as I enjoy John Malkovich being John Malkovich in this movie, you could edit him out of this film, and I don't think it would matter. Yeah, Any he, action that he takes, just let Tom do it. Yeah. And he doesn't really serve any purpose, other than to be somewhat entertaining. Somewhat, very. The most entertaining thing about this movie, if you ask me, the monster yeah. sure as hell suck. Central Bullock also sees a notebook that turns out to be Lil Ray Howard's book. And it turns out he was writing this post-apocalyptic novel. And he says, yeah, but this one's going to be real, not like Hunger Games or Maze Runner or something like that. Yeah, something successful that people would actually want to read. This is going to be some crap that I publish on the internet. <laughs> right. And that's when they hear the crash upstairs as B.D. Wong, you know, bashes his head in. And they realize like, oh, you can't even look at these things through a computer monitor. That'll make you go suicidal as well. So Sandra Bullock goes to bed and Olympia decides she's going to move into the bed next to hers and mm -hmm. says i just thought we should be close she talks about naming her baby and she says if she's a little girl i'm gonna name her ariel or jasmine or cinderella and i'll just call her ella you know what but people might think i named her after cruella and that's not right unless it's from that movie cruella where she was part of the fashion punk rock movement in london that would be good but i still think people might get confused you know what maybe i'm just gonna name her epcot or cars too what are you gonna name your baby yeah and central public is just like I think this is all just the worst. I can't believe I got stuck with you, but also I guess I should learn to be polite. So I haven't picked out a name yet and there is no guy because I didn't really care about the man. I was just, you know, I believe it's called being thrown a fuck and <laughs> uh, I turned out to get pregnant that way. So look, uh, how about you excuse me for a second? Um, I'm hearing some distant rumbling that I think is probably my conscience telling me that if I listen to you much more, I'm going to strangle you. So you stay right here. I'll be back. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Okay. okay. Goodbye. And so she j just goes wandering through the house and hears this noise in the closet, opens it up, uh -huh. and sure enough, Machine Gun Kelly and this 
Hispanic lady cop are fucking in the laundry room. Yeah. And Tom shows up after the door is closed. He's like, huh, well... I guess that's something you can't unsee. And they share a laugh and a moment. And we understand that once more, Tom is the sweetest, most understanding guy in the world. He says, you know what? I think I'll wait and do my laundry in the morning. Maybe you could come down and we could do laundry together. Of course, I'll be the one doing all your laundry. I couldn't ask a woman in your condition to do laundry. And by your condition, I don't mean pregnant. I mean beautiful. (laughs) <laughs> we got back to the start of our movie and the boat is floating down this miscovered river and we are now 14 hours on the river sandra bullock and the two kids are still blindfolded and off in the distance we hear a voice say hey hey strangers it's me a friendly voice filled with unthreatening folksy charm i'm just here to help you take off your blindfolds this is a safe place also hey would would you be interested in buying some timeshare or maybe investing in a cryptocurrency based on street fighter video games and sandra bullock says you do not take off your blindfolds children all right and you do not buy timeshare or cryptocurrency sandra bullock she then reaches down pulls out a gun and then after steering this boat a little closer to the shore blindfolded and then she as she's heading over the boy says hey hey kids i i got a i got a baby deer here you know what i also got a box full of adorable puppies and kittens does anybody over here like water slides <laughs> and sandra bullock is like Don't you dare take them blindfolds off. Well, okay, maybe girl, you can. But boy, don't you take the blindfold (laughs) off. And then she just starts firing her gun randomly, I think hitting an innocent cloud. But when we finally see him, this kindly mountain man shows up. He's wearing these wraparound like Oakley sunglasses and he just wades out into the water and he grabs Sandra Bullock's arm, the one with the gun in it. And here he turns real mean, real fast, as most mountain men do. And this mountain man says, take off your goddamn blindfold. (laughs) Go away. I think he might have been lying about those puppies and water slides. He keeps saying like, it's going to cleanse the world. Everyone must look. And she ends up grabbing this machete from inside the boat which is the first time we've seen this thing but fair enough sure and she just starts whacking him with it until she hits him in the shoulder and then the neck and he just kind of sinks into the water muttering gibberish about this revelation that he's seen after looking at the whatever it is don't worry about it we'll never see it either we do see the birds freak out a little bit when this guy gets real close but my thought was like i feel like the birds should start to chirp before this guy even speaks or they should introduce that when the birds go crazy evil is afoot although that's not always the case evil is around multiple times in this movie and the birds don't go crazy which really made me question do the birds really do anything at all other than just freak out when chaos starts happening around them basically reflect the mood of the room at any given time yeah it was like i don't know that they really are that good at their job yeah well they're birds man maybe the title should have been bird box with a question mark Right. Then we go back to the past where we're back in the house and Tom is saying like, look, I don't want to be the one to bring up a touchy subject here, but we do really need more food. And far be it for me to agree with John Malkovich, but he's right about this. I'm right about everything. Let me just say that both of you beautiful pregnant goddesses that we are sharing this space with, you look amazing today. You are glowing <laughs> You are powerful. You are self-assured. I just want you to know that we are here to support you. Lil Ray is like, you know, hey, I used to work at this grocery store. (laughs) Two days ago. Right. And so they're going to get a group together to go, which is going to be Tom, Sandra Bullock, Lil Ray, who protests about going to the grocery store, but also is going to go because he has the keys and knows where stuff is, etc. There is a, a line, like I like Lil Ray Howard. I thought he was great in Get Out. I think his line here about like, look, it's a grocery store. You know where things are. Like if you couldn't read, I would understand, but I know all of you can read. So I don't know what you need me for. And they take Malkovich and the female cop that machine gun kelly banged on the washing machine and so the plan to get there is actually one of the things i like in the movie i think this is pretty clever where they paint all of the windows of this suv so that they can't see out of it but the suv has collision detection on all sides so it'll warn you when you're about to run into something so if you drive slow enough and use the gps to get you to the store the idea is that you can make it there by kind of staying in the lines and driving driving around the obstacles that you detect through the collision detector. I'm like, okay, that's a pretty clever way to solve this problem. One of the few times in this movie where I thought 
hey, this is clever. I agree with that, but even the practicality of it, like if I asked you to do this, get uh-huh. in a car with this technology and drive from where you live to a nearby grocery store that's, you know, in this case, like what, three blocks away from this house. Right. And the streets are littered with corpses and cars that are on fire and all kinds of mayhem. Like it would take you at best what three hours to do this uh, you probably banging into shit and moving around and whatever else and what if the road was completely impassable and i get it they need food but it was just one of those moments i was like i don't know that i believe what's going on here but we'll keep moving forward also what else do you have to do in a day like you got three hours to spare to go three blocks on the way there they run over some people's heads and whatnot they hit a curb and then they're like okay that was just a curb and then there's a thump squish everybody kind of looks at each other in the car like that was ahead, right? We all, all right, let's just not talk about this right. because <laughs> we, we all have to be human beings and, and pretend that we didn't just roll over somebody's skull. Yeah. Now we have brains on the tire. Then they detect something in the road and it's not another car. And instead it's like moving around them. It g- gets on top of the roof. You know, everybody freaks out for a second and then they're fine. And that's kind of it. This scene should be more tense, but it's not. I would argue poorly directed and or edited. There is no tension in this at all no they end up at the store they blindfold in the car and they make their way into the store and then once they're inside they close the doors they realize nobody's there and then they just start shopping luckily someone has already covered up all of the windows with newspaper and blinds yeah i'm not sure when that happened but all right movie what okay I like that John Malkovich immediately heads to the liquor aisle and he just starts glug, glug, glugging. Yeah, it's been a little too long. Like you get a sense that maybe he has a couple of maintenance drinks every evening. (laughs) But yeah, so he's going for the booze. Sandra Bullock is doing some shopping and Tom brings over some diapers. My baby shower gift to you. It's it's a little joke. It's practical, but you know. Did I ever tell you that my sister, she's had a lot of babies. I've been around pregnant women with babies. I love to put my hand on their belly. I find it comforting and relaxing. Just being next to a woman, the majesty that she brings by bearing a child. So beautiful. You're so beautiful. Well, maybe if we met some other way in another life and she's like, Yeah, maybe I could have been your babysitter, you child. Yeah, but you would have been my hot babysitter. And so this is where Sandra Bullock finds the birds that are just kind of being kept in a cage. What kind of grocery store sells birds in a cage, Bo? I mean, unless they're meant to be eaten. The screenwriting grocery store. They sell (laughs) copies of Final Draft birds and all the groceries you need for the apocalypse. Then we get uh, some, some quality Malkovich here. You hear him announce over the speaker. It's a real like tap, tap, tap. Is this thing on? Everyone, head over to aisle seven. We have an important announcement. It's got liquor, wine, beer, and drunk movie stars. <laughs> that was a joke. So everyone comes around. And as much as I love Malkovich, I hate the delivery of this line so much. Where he's like, I just wanted to bring everyone over so we could do a toast for making the end of the world great again. Yeah! Yeah! I, this is clearly a Team MAGA reference. Right? Of course, yeah. Right. Although he redeems himself for that delivery in the next delivery where he sees the, the birds that Sandra Bullock has brought with her and he just says, birdies. I loved it. I want that to be my ringtone of every time you call me, I want my phone to go, birdies. <laughs> Malkovich goes on to say, don't you doofuses get it? We should just stay here. We shouldn't leave. Screw the people back at the B.D. Wong Memorial House. By the way, did anyone take care of his body? Or is it just upstairs rotting? And everyone is like, we can't do that because there are people waiting for us to bring this food back. Yeah, Malkovich says, there is no logical or practical or mathematical reason for us to return. We have everything we need right here. I've got a reason for you, John Malkovich. We're not assholes. We're going back. Yeah, I do. Like, we're not assholes. How about that as a reason? Before they can (laughs) resolve this. Knock, 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 knock. Candygram. Delivery for John Malkovich. Wait, I didn't order it. Box of his favorite liquor. Oh, it's liquor. Someone opened the door. (laughs) 
<laughs> Tom, who is benevolent to a fault, he's like, hey, everybody, everybody, cover your eyes. I'm going to open up this door and let these strangers in. And grocery store guy recognizes the voice and he says, fish fingers, is that you? And he explains that fish fingers works in the seafood department. But mm-hmm. how do you live with the nickname fish fingers? Well, he also says he's a little off. That, like, he spent some time in jail or something. We don't really get to see Fish Fingers, but I was secretly hoping that when they opened up the door, it would be Danny McBride or, like, Bill Paxton or Willem Dafoe. Like, any other A-list creepy actor Uh that you would never want to hang out in real life with. Uh, Unfortunately, you just kind of get a fat bearded dude yeah anyway the birds are going crazy here by the way right because everyone's arguing about whether or not they should let this dude into the piggly wiggly market and then malkovich out of nowhere has a shotgun Mm -hmm. (laughs) and he's drunk and he's pointing it at the door in this loading dock and they're like okay open it up and then grocery store guy sees fish fingers come in and he's a little nutty so grocery store guy just takes it on himself to give fish fingers the bums rush knock him back outside and then they close the door and then blood pools from under the door so grocery store guy gave his life saving others and he is now dead yes there's a real sense of like do we think that he made it oh (laughs) a pool of blood let's get out of here everybody returns back home without grocery store guy but they do have a lot of booze and when they get back machine gun kelly he embraces the female cop so they're in love Bo. Mm-hmm. and uh, they tell everybody hey grocery store guy he died uh saving all of us dude if i may th- again just to point out the terrific malkovich moments here <laughs> when they ask like hey where is lil ray howard the guy that was writing this apocalyptic book and told us all about what the threat was outside malkovich says well that's another novel i won't have to read <laughs> <laughs> and Sandra Bullock responds with, he saved our lives, you fucking asshole. <laughs> So anyway, we cut to late night and Malkovich and Sandra Bullock are sharing a drink in the kitchen. Well, she's pregnant and it's the end of the world. So why not? She's basically saying like, you know, I recognize you. You're a real asshole like my father was. Malkovich says, well, there are only two kinds of people in my experience, assholes and the dead. And so they end up sharing a drink and it's kind of a nice moment within this film of her recognizing like he's a jerk. He knows he's a jerk and he also appreciates that she's not a jerk. I don't know that self-aware jerks makes him any better or more likable. I agree, but at least there's this sort of understanding of the two that they're on the same team, even if they're kind of playing different roles on the team. Okay. And Sandra Bullock says, well, let's make a toast. Here's hoping there's more than just assholes in the dead. And he toasts with her you know and then they (laughs) hear something outside and realize that machine gun kelly and hispanic lady cop have taken the car and just booked yes which is probably not the worst idea i mean are they just like slowly driving down the street using censored logic if that's the case they probably could have catch them real quick they weren't going more than five miles an hour perhaps but yeah it's one of those things of like i don't know where they're going it would have been nice to get some sense that maybe they were in cahoots and were scheming something but anyway they just take off so that we have fewer characters to worry about because that's a messy screenplay when you got to bounce all those characters off one another then we cut forward again to 24 hours on the river where are these people pooping and peeing just over the side even i know that you've clearly never been in a rowboat it doesn't work that way you can't just hang your ass cheeks off the side of a rowboat you'd flip it over even a big one like this maybe maybe you just get in the water for a minute and let it go i could see that happening to me again (laughs) <laughs> sorry so the boat is in the river it's moving along at a pretty good clip and then finally it crashes into something a submerged truck in the water which i think was there before the apocalypse came and when they crash the little boy falls into the water probably because he had to go poopies and he just starts crying <laughs> out for sandra bullock it should be noted they do not call her mom or mother they call her mallory which is our character's name during this crash our three boat participants they lose their food and the blankets go in the water and then sandra bullock just blindly rows them over to the shore which is plain silly 
that she would be able to do this. And this is followed by Sandra Bullock just wandering off in the woods with her blindfold on, unspooling maybe like some fishing line that's tied back to the boat as she wanders over to what appears to be maybe like a house or a summer cabin. And I was like, this is all completely unbelievable. You just like sploosh, sploosh, sploosh the boat over. It's like, you children, wait here. I'm going to go find us a house with some food and blankets and, and maybe a transistor radio so you can listen to some kids bop. No, where are you going? You're blindfolded. Yeah. And she's got this fishing line hooked to her belt. And that's sort of how she's going to find her way back. She gets inside this summer camp building. And you again, once you're inside, you're free to take off your blindfold. Monsters do not like the indoors. They like all that fresh air. And she's kind of walking around and she ties the end of her fishing line to a bedpost so she can move more freely because the, the length of the fishing line runs out. And she starts to collect all these provisions. Then we come back to the boat and the little girl stands up. This starts to build some suspense. And then the spooled fishing line gives a tug on the boat. It has hints of Jaws of Quint's fishing line with that click, 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 click. You know, you know something's coming, but it never builds to the payoff that you get in Jaws. No, 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 no. I mean, comparing any of this to Jaws. I'm drawing comparisons in the way that they're trying to build suspense. But the problem is that they're like Jaws lived off the fact that you tease a reveal that doesn't come until the very end. And this is a movie that teases the reveal until the movie just ends without ever the, <laughs> getting the reveal. Well, yeah, she's seeing like a shadow under the door. There's something calling her name. And then she just runs back to the boat and chastises the girl for going to look for her, like, I, I told you not to leave the boat. You could have died. If anything ever happens to me, you just go. Do you understand me? You get in the boat and you get out of here. Okay. And then the movie cuts back to the past at the D.B. Wong house. And Sandra Bullock is talking to Tom, who here we find out Bo is an Iraq veteran. Of course. And he also volunteers at a children's cancer hospital and fosters mm -hmm. cats and dogs looking for their forever homes. Tom tells Sandra Bullock this story of tragedy from his time in the service that ends with him giving a backstory to a necklace that he wears around his neck that involved a father giving his life for his children dude this whole story of he walked his kids to school every day even in the midst of this war zone and i like to believe that he's still doing that he's out there walking those kids back and forth to school every day right now there's there is hope in the world yeah whatever you say i just love your abs and these pectorals i want to lick your nipples and then she reaches over and grabs tom's hand and puts it on her belly because he talked about how much comfort he found in touching his sister's stomach when she right. was pregnant is this doing anything for you yeah. is this getting you hot because i gotta tell you i got the faucets open downstairs the movie then cuts quickly back to the past to tell us they've been on the river 28 hours and sandra bullock's on the radio calling for help she's like hey anybody out there rick 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 and then we head back to the present mm -hmm. and Sandra Bullock is on the radio here calling for help. Like, hey, is anybody out there? Rick, Rick, Rick. Oh, wait, that was from earlier scene. And then before this can really go anywhere, Olympia, the other pregnant lady, she comes walking in and there's a knock, knock, knock on the door. And she's like, oh, get it. And she walks over and just lets this guy, Gary, into our movie. And Gary looks a lot like Paul Giamatti's younger brother. He's a real <laughs> Jim Belushi to his John. For sure. Gary Giamatti, he comes in and he says, hey, look out. I got to pee. Wait, this guy was banging on the door to come inside to take a piss? No, we're respectable man would do that you just piss outside like the world is blindfolded just whip it out and let it go man even if it's not you just go it's the end of the world go shit outside piss outside you can jerk off on the middle of the street you don't have to be in san diego to do that sandra bullock pulls the shotgun on him and it's like i will blow you away right now whoa 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 they're after me these guys from northwood it's a mental institution it's where the crazies are they're running around making people look at the creatures not me of course other people he starts sobbing he's like, thank you for letting me in oh they're those crazy people they weren't wearing blindfolds they said everyone needed to see the birds chirp for just a little bit they're like tweet tweet something going on tweet keep an eye on this guy tweet tweet balkovich says well, it's been a great visit, but fuck off. Get the fuck out of this house. It's so good, man. And <laughs> and he rightly says, every contact with the outside world has brought us death. Get yeah. this guy out of here. 
And then that old lady who you forgot was in the movie, she comes up and just bonks John Malkovich on the head with a vase, rendering him unconscious. So then Tom says, hey, hey, I'll, I'll take John Malkovich out to the garage and lock him in there. Keep this drunken, crazy old red state lunatic where he belongs. Like, yes, let us sideline the only interesting character in this movie. Thank you, movie. Olympia then tells Central Bullock, like, look, I let Gary in because I know what it was like to be on the other side of that door. And then... <laughs> backing up that bad decision she makes another one where she says listen central bullock if something happens to me i need you to take care of my baby okay and central bullock is no, like no oh, no look i'm not really comfortable taking care of one baby much less two so how about a big pass on that lady four days ago i, I was seriously considering giving this one up for adoption or possibly having a very 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 late term abortion i am not the person you want raising your baby look there's no one else you've got to promise me and finally she's like oh all right look here Here's this Hello Kitty stuffed animal I got you. It's not much uh, of a gift, but, you know, you can give this to your daughter later or something. And then we cut to the future where we see the little girl is now holding this Thai Beanie Baby stuffed Hello Kitty head. This is the moment where you realize, oh, okay, the little girl is Olympia's daughter, which means that the boy is her son. Right. Because up until this point, the film has not clearly stated that. Now, when Olympia shows up, you're like, oh, this is where the two kids are coming from. But now we know who belongs to who. So Sandra Bullock says, listen, we've got some rapids coming up. Here's the real problem here. One of you is going to have to look to guide us through the rapids. Dude, think about that. She is asking a five-year-old to guide them through the rapids. Right. Have you ever read one of those recipes that five-year-olds write about like how their mom makes pancakes and it involves cat food and jelly beans and shit like that? These kids are worthless. Yeah. She might as well have the birds tweet which way they should go in the rapids. <laughs> right. Just as helpful. Like Probably more so. The boy volunteers and Central Bullock is like, no, no boy. I'm going to be the one who makes the decision, not you. I will be the one who decides. Mm -hmm. Little girl's like, I'll go. I'm considering that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you are number one with a bullet, girl. But boy, no, girl, you're on my list of, of candidates <laughs> to look you and the birds and the boy, but you and the birds. I'm, I'm considering. One of you two definitely has to look. It's not going to be the boy and you girl are a possibility. Take that as you will. Uh, you might want to settle any affairs that you have. <laughs> get get right with God. The movie cuts back to the B.D. Wong Memorial House and Museum. Gary Giamatti, he's in the kitchen just bopping around to the Aretha Franklin song, Say a Little Prayer for You. And wouldn't you know it, Bo, both Olympia and Sandra Bullock go into labor at the exact same time. And apparently that old lady who comes in and out of our movie, she works part-time as a doula and then her spare time volunteers as a midwife and she just leaps into action she's like give me some scissors and a bucket of water you know old lady <laughs> movie characters on the case <laughs> yeah and malkovich is just watching all this from the garage peeking in like a dog wanting to come in from the rain i've got <laughs> some things i want to say i promise most of them won't be racist look i'm wonderful around children anyone who knows me can tell you that let me come in from the garage there's a draft in here i love kids especially when they're barbecued i'm joking i'm not gonna eat a child also can i have the gun and that bottle of gray goose look everyone knows that the only way to keep someone from using a gun is to pour booze on the problem <laughs> Tom, of course, is helping Sandra Bullock upstairs. While everyone else is upstairs dealing with babies coming, Gary then puts on some classical music and starts spinning around and dancing and <laughs> thumbs through some sketches that he's done. And they're all like these cosmic horrors in charcoal. And we're like, oh, something is not right with Gary here. Meanwhile, upstairs, Sandra Bullock uh, has her child, which is the boy. It's a boy! congratulations now what's going on over here young missy yeah it's a girl correct congratulations part two <laughs> and gary is downstairs and he hears the babies crying malkovich is like hey gary that's your name right how about you let me in and gary ignores this to put the birds that are completely useless in almost every situation into the freezer and then just starts tearing off the paper covering up all the windows and malkovich is like what are you doing everyone gary giamatti is fucking crazy and so tom runs downstairs to see what's going on and gary just brains him with a brick you know how about a little brick scarecrow and then he opens up the garage door so that john malkovich 
Malkovich is now what? Going to die? Close your eyes, John Malkovich. Right, which is what he does because Malkovich is no fool. But So Gary shows up upstairs and Sandra Bullock is like, hey, what's going on down there? It sounded like, I don't know, somebody had flipped their wig and opened a garage door and maybe knocked out that sexy hunk who's done everything for everyone and never asked for anything of his own. Gary's just like, hey, let me look at these babies. He you know, like eyes both the babies and he says, well, thanks. And then just starts opening up blinds and tearing down the paper in this room. And immediately Olympia sees something outside and her eyeballs go all kooky. She starts to walk towards the window and Sandra Bullock is like, Olympia, you got to give me that baby. Give me the baby. Let me just see the baby for a second, okay? Give me the baby. And finally Olympia gives up the baby to her and then olympia just barrels for the window runs and jumps out of it when she tumbles out it reminded me of a super dave osborne sketch (laughs) (laughs) yeah is that a mannequin then gary grabs the old lady who Mm -hmm. we keep forgetting is in the movie even in the scenes that she's in yeah he goes full clockwork orange on her. Right. And he's like, Biddy well, little brother. Forces her eyes open with his fingers. Yeah. And she's like, not lovely, lovely Ludwig Van. Then when <laughs> the lady sees and her eyeballs go all kooky, she just takes the scissors that she's holding and stabs it in her neck. Yeah. And so she's dead now. Yep. And so then Gary looks at Central Bullock and is like, hey, give me the kids. That's where Malkovich shows up from downstairs. Da, 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 <laughs> drunk. My <laughs> eyes are closed and I've got a shotgun in my hands. I'm going to use <laughs> da, 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 drunk <laughs> more often in my day-to-day life. Uh, but yeah, his eyes are squeezed shut. He, he's waving the shotgun around, like trying to shoot this guy by sound. He hits him. Yeah, hits him in the shoulder, and then Gary rushes him, and they both go ass over tea kettle over the stair railing. And then Gary grabs the scissors that have gone over with them and stabs Malkovich in the in the chest with scissors. And he says, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you didn't get to see." And you're like, "Oh man, the one character I liked in this movie is dead now." The good news is we're really close to the end. Yeah, that's true. Once again, Gary's repeats this thing we've been hearing from the people who see in this movie the it's gonna cleanse the world and gary and tom who has come to downstairs start struggling for the shotgun and then we cut up to sandra bullock in time to hear two shots but you don't know who got got right She's just got her eyes closed and is, is holding the babies and like, I'm waiting to die. Tom shows up with a blanket over his head. Then we get a cut to of a little bit later, I guess, when they've covered the windows back up and they're just hanging out on the couch with the babies and the blinds down. And then the movie cuts to five years later. Mm-hmm. But this was before our movie actually started. So we're pre-River, but post B.D. Wong house slash maternity ward. That's right. The kids are now older. They're the age that we've seen them in the movie thus far and sandra bullock is teaching them how to listen to rocks clack together with their blindfolds on to recognize different types of sound again i had so many questions like where are they getting food and clothes and haircuts and eyeliner for sandra bullock it it shows that they have a little garden that they've built Mm -hmm. i guess that helps out i also want to know who trims tom's hair and his beard because these hairlines are immaculate yeah i mean they should look like tom hanks the halfway point of castaway I mean, they should just look like homeless, crazy people. That's what you look (laughs) like after five years of nightmares and raising two kids. And that's just in the normal world. It's the craziest thing. My hair just grows to this length and stays. He is so good looking in this movie. Yeah. So Sandra Bullock wanders through the woods, leaving this house. that Apparently they've been at long enough that they made a garden, or maybe they just found a house that had a garden. She enters this new house that she finds, and she grabs some prescription drugs, as you do when you mm-hmm. visit a new house. And she also finds a women's nightgown. Mm-hmm. She grabs a bell from a bicycle that will come into play later. And then about this time, three cars pull up in menacing fashion. They start doing donuts and shit out in the driveway, and then they take off. Sandra Bullock returns to the original home that she shares with tom and the kids uh sandra book tells tom i heard some of them driving around like they're not blindfolded and then the movie takes a break for sandra bullock and tom to have sex unnecessarily we do get a shot of tom with his shirt off and he has got an eight pack and deep v i mean he's got to just spend most of his free time doing crunches right yeah it's like he's auditioning for one of those marvel movies yeah where he's gonna be a superhero named a nice guy (laughs) then a voice comes on over the handheld radio and it goes hello my name is rick we have a community it's safe here you can get here by boat. 
but I don't think you can make it with kids. By the way, I'm the same voice from the start of the movie. You'll need to float downstream until you hit the rapids. Then you're going to have to look when you're on the rapids. Why do you have to look? Uh, don't ask questions. You'll find us when you start to hear lots of birds. Now, I know that normally when you hear lots of birds, that means that there are monsters around. But these birds are different birds. So when you hear them going crazy, they're the good birds. So listen for the good birds and not the alarming birds. And then you're going to go to this wall. Not that, not the tall wall. It's a medium wall. There's also a short wall. But when you find, you'll find the tall wall. It's about five feet tall. How tall are you? Because that's going to determine whether or not you think it's small, medium, or large. All right, get to the tall wall. You're going to go left. And then when you get down to the mid midpoint of the wall, you're going to hang a right and go about two blocks uh, past the abandoned gas station. And then we're in the, the compound there. Over. <laughs> Yeah, it it is a real, like, hey, uh, if I have to draw you a map, I can mail it over. Think about going anywhere, Bo, with a blindfold on. This is an impossible task. And you're getting in a boat, and there's rapids, and two days, and birds, and a wall, and a, like, just, you're, like you said, just lean into it. You're to just die. This is over. This is Tom's point. Like, they're debating this. And Central Public is like, there's no way we're going to do this. We don't know who those people are. They could want to eat our children. We have no idea how to judge their character based on Rick talking to us through the radio. As right. much as I like saying, Rick, 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 Rick. That is the only thing he's got going for him right now. Tom is like, look, we are running out of food. We got to do something. We can't continue to live here. And also, you heard those hooligans that have seen the whatever the fuck it is and have gone crazy. We need to find a, a, a safe place with other people. Tom goes in and, and lays down with the little boy and the little girl. And he tells them this story of how amazing this place is that has like blue skies and tall trees and other kids there you can play with. And they're handsome kids, just like the two of you, not as handsome as me. And you'll be able to climb a tree. And you know what the most amazing part of this story is? And then Sandra Bullock comes in and she's like, boy, girl. Get out of here. Quit getting your hopes up. Get to bed. And then boy runs off and girl's kind of defiant. She's like, girl, shoo, you get out of here. Don't make me get my broom and shoo you out of this room. After she sends him off to bed, she gives Tom the business. She's like, look, I know you are handsome and wonderful and good at everything, but you have to stop giving those children hope. They are not going to ever climb trees and run around with kids and play games. All they are ever going to do is eat dirt and have incest babies to try to repopulate this portion of the earth. And those babies are going to be weird, Tom. They're going to be real strange, missing fingers, probably weird teeth. Do you ever see deliverance, Tom? Well, you can't now because it's the apocalypse. And that is my point. 47, 48, 49. 50 ugh, 50 crunches every half hour i agree with you okay <laughs> but here's the thing sandra bullock these kids they deserve a mother you haven't even given them names you call them boy and girl and sandra bullock says every single decision i've made was for these two children and for your information they do have names boy is named after boy george my favorite 80s glam band lead singer and girl is named after my favorite Hanna Barbera cartoon magilla gorilla I call her girl, for short. Now, who's the asshole now, Tom? Clearly, it's still me, because you're a perfect human being. But, Tom, cut me some slack. I'm doing the best I can. Later on in bed, while Sandra Bullock is kind of fuming, Tom is like, listen, I didn't get to finish my story, but at the top of that tree that I was climbing, I uh -huh. saw a nest, and it had birds in them. Five of them. You know, like the title of this movie. All right, just go to bed. You were too perfect. I just can't stand how perfect you are right now. Hang on. Let me feel your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> i want to listen to your heartbeat oh my god even your blood pressure is perfect the whole family then goes to a new house with pre-covered windows and sandra bullock finds a box of strawberry pop tarts and she and tom kind of make up as some romantic music plays in the background the kids find some toys and try to figure out what playing is mm -hmm. and then sandra bullock goes over and she takes some of these stale pop tarts and feeds them to the kids it's all very wholesome they're all smiling at each other except uh, she lies to them by saying this is what strawberry tastes like and as a connoisseur of pop tarts strawberry pop tarts do not taste anything like strawberries <laughs> it is a flavor unto itself maybe if she had looked in the garden at the last house she could have showed them what real strawberries taste like that's for her and tom <laughs> when they have nine and a half week sex they're jamming each other's mouth <laughs> <laughs> do not touch those strawberries that is for me and your father the tone of this movie is kind of all 
over the place. Speaking of which, during this wholesome moment, those assholes that have seen the monster, they show up driving their cars recklessly and start chunking rocks through the windows of this house. Tom gives Sandra Bullock the necklace that he received in Iraq from the guy who was walking his kids to school and got killed or the kids got killed. Something helped Tom become a much more uh, likable character. So Tom goes outside with his blindfold on. He's got a loaded shotgun in his hand and he faces off against these marauders. Again, these people have seen the creature and they've lived to tell about it. And the main guy, Marauder, is David Datsmalchin, mm-hmm. I think how you say his name, who was Polka Dot Man in that remake of Suicide Squad. And he was also one of the guys who worked with Lewis in the Ant-Man movies when they were pulling mm-hmm. off their little heists. Yeah, yeah, he's a fun actor. Here he just gets shot. Yeah, it's a whole gang of crazies out there. And, you know, Tom is distracting them so that Sandra Bullock and the kids can get away. Hey, look at all this handsome over here. Oh my God, thank God we don't wear blindfolds. I mean, we want you to see and be purified, but also... I'm I'm surprised that when they looked at him, it didn't break the spell. (laughs) He's so wholesome (laughs) that they're like, oh my God. The other thing that's really interesting doesn't come up anywhere else and it doesn't even get used here, but I like the fact that one of the people in the group, the lady crazy, has this hook like you might use to bring a bad act off stage at the Apollo. Right. But in this case, she's using it to like tug off a blindfold. I was like, Oh, that's kind of an interesting little bit of world texture that whenever they spot somebody with a blindfold, they're just like using this hook to go, yoink. Okay, now you're either dead or one of us, I guess. And why only criminals find, you know, something inside the these visions that they're having to respond to. Like, none of this makes a whole lot of sense. And it, and it much like Army of the Dead, a lot of this stuff asks more questions than it answers and not right. in an interesting way, but just in a genuinely unsatisfying way. That kind of goes to my point earlier, where I was like, I think if you leaned more into the abstract and, and maybe didn't show those details and just let your imagination fill in the blank, you can get away with this more. By starting to fill in the gaps, it's like, well, wait a minute. What about this? And where did they come from? And what's going on? And- I wish it were just like some people have a different reaction to it and just leave it at that. Did you think much about The Stand when you watch this? A little bit, but I mean, The Stand is so much more religious and it's... Right. Even though it uses sort of pseudo-religious explanations for what is going on it is not a movie that deals with that i really thought that the movie would focus more on the characters in the house and their different ideologies or cultural or religious beliefs but none of that happens it's way too plot driven and this is so devoid of character development it's yeah i mean even Sandra bullock's character is like she is misanthropic and closed off and emotionally disconnected and then she's not Right. You know, that's kind of her journey. But yeah. uh, anyway, but so Tom is distracting them all with his good looks and charm. He shoots two of them blindfolded perfectly, not in the shoulder, like in the gut. Then he takes off his blindfold to go after the other two. He ends up taking most of them down, except for Des Malchin, who is chasing after Central Bullock and the kids. Tom takes off after him, sees something, like you see his eyes go all kooky, and he's got enough presence of mind to shoot David Desmalchen before turning the gun on himself. R.I.P. Tom. Yeah, sadly. And Sandra Bullock seems to sense that disturbance in the force when she hears the two gunshots that like, oh, Tom's dead now. Right. That's where we kind of circle back yet again to the beginning of the movie where she leads the kids back to the house and tells them to pack all their shit. And it's that speech of, you have to do what I say or you are dead. Do you understand me? This is all just stuff that they don't need and that kind of thing. And then we cut to sort of the final movement of the film, which is 42 hours on the river. Sandra Bullock gets them to huddle up under the blanket again. And she says, okay, I got to pick which one of you I like the least. Boy, don't worry about it. Uh, I think you're going to be okay. Um, now, <laughs> you, McGilla Gorilla, uh, I, I, got, I got some bad news, okay? The committee got together, and uh, and uh, uh, and then you're thinking, like, this is going to be real heavy. And I think the little girl here says, like, I'll just do it. She's like, no, 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 it doesn't mean the same thing if you volunteer. I decide. I have to decide. I am deciding nobody looks at the rapids, including the birds. 
what? They're going to raw dog it down the river. <laughs> Which is what happened. The rowboat goes down the rapids. And of course, everybody gets tossed out when the boat flips over. I don't think having these kids look would have done jack shit to prevent this outcome. Boy and girl, they're flopping around in the water, as are the birds, which how they didn't drown is beyond me. And this is probably the most believable scene for me in the whole movie. Until they all are like miraculously are able to find each other in this water. I think girl is holding that little bell that Sandra Bullock pilfered earlier. And she's like, ring, ring, ring. She's like, Sandra Bullock, come over here. And she grabs the boy and they all swim together. And then Sandra Bullock says, hey, I think I know where we are. We just need to follow the sound of the birds because these birds don't mean that there's monsters nearby or something. They just wander through the woods, Bo, blindfolded. Yeah. Looking for a wall that leads to a gas station that leads to a something. And that's kind of the final moments of this movie before we get to the final, final resolution is after the rapids, like, and getting to the shore, finding each other, clinging to rocks and on the beach and that kind of stuff. And then they're just wandering through the woods while these ghost voices or whatever are like, hey, take off your blindfold. No, seriously, take it off. For the kids, they hear Sandra Bullock's voice saying, go ahead, just do it. It's safe here. You can take off your blindfold. And meanwhile, Sandra Bullock is like, no, don't take off your blindfold. You might be hearing something telling you to take off the blindfold. Don't do it. And her hearing Tom and her sister telling her to, to take off the blindfold. Yeah. And the big emotional crux of this is while she's hunting around, she finds Boy... And she's calling for a girl and boy says, she's scared of you. You're, you're kind of a dick. You're always so mean to her. She does not like you very much. <laughs> you are super mean. Why are you so mean? And then Sandra Bullock gives this big speech about like, you know, I'm look, I'm sorry I ended Tom's story. I know I've been mean to you, but what he saw at the top of that tree, it was hundreds of children playing games and all of them were together and we were there and there were birds of every color. And girl, you just have to keep your blindfold on and come back to me. The girl does. And then she comes and, you know, end of kind of end of threat. And then they're sort of being chased by these things. But again, I don't know what they can do to you if you're not looking at them. Nothing. They can just cool you off. That's just a breeze. And so they follow the sounds of the birds to get to this door this is where i'm a dope chad and and have become too emotional in my old age okay but the moment where she is at the door and like she's being chased by the things and she's just uh like banging on the door saying please even if you don't take me take my children please save my children and i'm like man sandra bullock is like tugging at my heart here because she's so good at this pleading of like I don't care if I survive this. Just please, for the love of God, let my children survive. No, and I found it very affecting. I, you know, I, 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 again, I feel bad about being emotionally moved by a movie that's not very good. But I think it's to Sandra Bullock's credit that she can pull off these big emotional swings in this movie, despite the fact that the screenplay isn't very good. The door opens up, and here we meet the mysterious Rick from the radio. Rick, 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 Rick. For a moment, I thought that Rick would be played by some megastar with a cameo, like a Dreyfus or a Hoffman, but it's just some dude. It's Pruitt Taylor Vince. He's he's a great character actor. He's in, He's been in a ton of things. He ain't nobody I recognize, okay? I, re I recognize him, because I'm, I'm a cinephile. <laughs> <laughs> they all go into this building, and everybody takes off their blindfolds, and we see a sign that we are at the janet tucker school for the blind uh -huh. i don't know who janet tucker is and i was too tired to look it up at this point in uh in my note taking and we also see that rick is also blind what a twist bow or i think he's blind because rick does say i'm going to get you some dry clothes and i'm like one how does he know they need dry clothes two what size is he going to bring them back <laughs> right i'm hearing a size four inside the courtyard <laughs> Are these large trees and birds of all sorts of color, just like Tom Story, Bo. Um, and all the kids that we see here, I think most of them are blind. And then in a plot contrivance that we did not need, Sandra Bullock's baby doctor from the start of the movie walks over and she says, What a sight for sore eyes, Sandra Bullock, the star of the movie. And who are these two young ones? And the boy's like, I'm boy. And the girl's like, I'm girl. And Sandra Bullock says, no, 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 children. Thems ain't your names. Little girl, your, na your name's going to be Olivia. Now, that was your mama's name. Now, she really wanted to name you Jasmine or Cinderella or Epcot or Cars 2, but 
I'm going to go against her, her dying wishes and name you something different. <laughs> Dude, my favorite part of this is the look that Dr. Lapham gives her when they introduce themselves as boy and girl. And she's just like, oh, this has gone totally tits up. Like this whole motherhood thing, <laughs> this did not work out for her at all. Oh boy, she should have just given these kids up. Of all the mothers I knew, why did this one survive? Do you still have that pamphlet? It's not too late to give up these children for adoption. They can find a loving home. <laughs> there are many people around here that would be very happy to have children. Some of them lost children to the unknown thing that is happening yes, to us all that that woman over there that 12 year old blind girl perhaps her, her seeing eye dog that golden retriever might be a better mother than you sandra bullock she looks at boy and says boy your real name is tom i'm gonna name him after the fella we've been with or, or your whole life the reason i didn't call you tom when he was around because then we would have had two toms i didn't want to call you tom jr because then you would have just we'd have called you tj and I knew a guy named TJ once, and he never used deodorant. And he smelled all the time. Come think of it, we all do. But you, your name's your name's gonna be Tom now. All right. Then she's like, "Hey, do you want to go play with other kids? Even though you've never socialized at all, and are probably gonna be complete nightmares to everyone around you." What what is what does play mean? Um, it is where you do make 'em ups and uh what? throw balls at one another. What what is a ball? Huh. This is gonna be tougher than I thought. How about? You just chase some of these birds around. And speaking of, how about we let the birds that we've had the whole time loose because they never did shit for us anyway. That's what she does. She opens the box and these wet birds flop, flop, flop out. I would assume they would have had clipped wings, but maybe those aren't the same birds from the Piggly Wiggly earlier. Sandra Bullock just wanders into the courtyard and smiles at this nightmarish utopia in which they will live. And then all of those 8 to 14 minutes of credits start to roll into Bird Box. It's a real nothing of an ending, you know? I mean, aside from the emotional release of it all, I suppose, of, you know, her becoming uh, an actual mother. And, and that is the thematic point of the film. But the climax feels really anticlimactic. Uh -huh. It's, again, just very unsatisfying. You know, I know we keep saying this uh, in our discussion of this movie. It's just not a very good script. You know, it's got good actors in it. The direction isn't awful, despite the fact that it's not very scary and it's not very tense. Like the movie, for being a movie that is supposed to scare you, forgets to ever be scary. Right. Um, And that's not great. But it's not terrible. It's just not very good good and like if someone had never seen it and was a big Sandra Bullock fan maybe you would you would want to watch it on that count but honestly the better version of this movie is A Quiet Place or The Happening it's yeah no it's shot well mm -hmm. the like a lot of the second unit work like there's establishing shots things that you can tell are being done with an artistic eye I don't know that it's edited as well as it could have been and i think especially in, in things like this where like you you ratchet up the tension editing can really help uh that a lot I, I definitely think sandra bullock and john malkovich being in this film buoyed it to a level of quality that lesser than actors would not have delivered mm -hmm. but yeah i think you're right i think that the the problem with this just lies on the the screenplay and again or maybe the source material i don't know it's Oh, our season finale bow does not. Um, we have truly saved the worst for last. <laughs> but would you care to introduce how we're going to cap off this sextet of ugh? Well, we are being drafted and flung far into the future, Chad, by which I mean two weeks, to discuss a movie called The Tomorrow War, starring the eponymous actor Chris Pratt, uh, that lady from Chuck, and J.K. Simmons. It's really terrible. Like, it's got time travel. It's got alien invasion. It's got military fighting and impossible force. All of the ingredients that you think, like, how do you screw this up? And Tomorrow War says, hold my beer and let me show you. Yeah. Uh, it is... Uh, the first time I watched it, I didn't make it all the way through. It was only in returning to the season. I actually threw up... A little bit of a question uh not quite a poll in the discord group for uh, the legion podcast folks and i said hey we got one more movie to go what do you guys think and somebody mentioned the tomorrow war and i was like oh right 
that movie that I couldn't get through at all the first time. Let's see if I can get through it a second time. And I did and realized, as you said, there is no better way to send off this season of straight-to-streaming movies with one of the best examples of a terrible straight-to-streaming movie. This makes Army of the Dead look like Apocalypse Now. I mean, it's, it is it is such a misguided mess of a movie that I almost feel bad making fun of it. It's so rough. But it gives us an opportunity because I don't think we've done Chris Pratt before. This will be his debut because the only films that he's ever been in are the Jurassic World movies, the Guardians movies, and then voice acting. I don't think he's done much beyond that. Yeah. And so the Guardians movies are too good for us to do, and the Jurassic World movies have been too long. Right. But are plenty terrible. Yeah. But yeah, so this will be the pick six debut of Chris Pratt, which is overdue. Agree. Huh. Well, episode five, done and done. Episode six is coming up. If you would like to reach out to us, you can email us at pick six movies at gmail.com. You can like, rate, review. Please tell your friends about the show. Let us know uh, if you have any feedback, if you have recommendations for future seasons. We are always entertaining new ideas as we are on the precipice of wrapping this one up and starting a brand new season 24 here in just a few short weeks. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Bird Box? I would like to wrap this up so I can get back to drinking. Where's my gun? (laughs) We'll see you in two weeks, everybody.